sometimes people will kind of want to control you as long as they feel like they can. And then once they can't, it's like they have to see you as a sovereign being and me being in my power. For the first time, like this year, I heard my dad say, I love you and I'm proud of you. I hope you will consider joining me for Rebirth 2023, my most popular annual course. It kicks off on January 16th, and over two weeks, I will be bringing you various teaching modules on renewing your soul and charting your path. The experience includes exclusive channeled transmissions from my guides, the Z's, many delivered live, Qi Gong from Stephen Washington, a live Q&A, a community forum, support resources, and some special guest teachers and bonus content. To learn more, see the link below and use the code IMPACT10 for a 10% discount. Hello, welcome to Impact the World. My guest this week is Sahara Rose. Sahara is someone I only came across in recent months, and I was immediately struck by the myriad of ways that she brings her work and her mission to the world. She really is a multidimensional creative and spiritual teacher, and she has a fascinating story about how she got involved in spirituality and how her work took her through activism into spirituality and some of her very deep personal life experiences led to what she's doing now. So I loved this conversation with her. She's a very bright light in the world. And what I enjoy about her is her, she has a deep confidence in her mission, which she has had to earn. It didn't come easily to her and she shares some of the scrapes and bumps that she has gone through along the way. We speak about rejection and how you often get rejected many times before you get accepted. The spiritual gift of meeting Deepak Chopra, who was an idol to her because he was her big spiritual activator when she was a child and he went on to write the foreword for three of her books. We speak about life purpose and Dharma and we also speak about events in Iran and our perspective on oppression, freedom. It's a deep conversation. She's a bright light. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope it sparks something in you for living your life to the fullest, which really is what she is an advocate of. As ever, if you like the show, we are an independent, self-funded show, so it means the world to us if you subscribe, rate, or review. Please subscribe to the channel on YouTube if you're watching, or on Apple Podcasts, or whichever system you use to get Impact the World into your ears, heart, mind, and soul. So stay tuned for Sahara Rose, and we hope you enjoy. Sahara, it's so lovely to be with you today. Thank you for being here. Mm, I'm so excited to be here on this podcast that I adore, so it's an especially special offer today. You were very new to me. I had not heard of you until fairly recently, and I think we got connected through a friend who recommended, and I I have to say, I went and had a look at what you do in the world, and I was blown away because obviously, what, what I'll tell you what hit me. What hit me is you really are multidimensional spirituality in action, and of course, you're younger than me, and you're having an incredible effect, especially on the millennial generation, and it's so heartening to see that and to see it broken down in digestible, grounded ways. So I guess the first thing I'm curious about for you, what's your backstory when it comes to spirituality? How did you find it? What was your breakthrough and anything that you feel to share? 
Yes. So my mother was a refugee who escaped during the Iran-Iraq war in 1981. And my father was an immigrant who fled right before the Iranian revolution. So Iran is majorly in the news right now. And growing up, that was the story I heard about every single day, the revolution and everything that could go wrong. And that overnight, your life can be taken away from you. So make sure you have a really solid education and a plan and structure and and systems as, as much as you can, because life is so out of your control. So there was this undercurrent of deep seated fear and trauma, rightfully so. You know, so many people in the world experience displacement. But then I was born into, into this earth with a soul that wanted to travel and explore and take risks and ask bigger questions. And, you know, I believe my soul needed to choose my parents to, to also give me a front row seat into what living in extreme fear can look like and vice versa for them to see what living in freedom can look like. So I grew up in Boston, really near Salem, Massachusetts, which is where the witch trials happened. Mm. And as soon as I learned about them when I was like eight years old, I knew I was a witch. Mm -hmm. And I became obsessed with learning everything about the witch trials, but also just rituals and practices. And I was a very intuitive child. I would see spirits all the time and have conversations with them and come up with these, you know, fantastical worlds that I probably wasn't really coming up with, but rather visiting, you know, Lemuria, um, many, many different places that now it's like, oh yeah, Lemuria, Atlantis, duh. But at that time, people thought I was crazy. And At one point in fourth grade, I was walking across a hill and the kids were all afraid of me because they called me the witch. And the kids were literally chanting, burn the witch at the stake, burn the witch at the stake. And this boy pushed me down the hill, a very steep one, and he was wearing a metal cast, like those ones that you can walk on. And he came tumbling down after me and his cast hit my head and I got a concussion. And I rolled down that hill unconscious. And when I woke up, I just saw the kids surrounding me laughing. Hmm. And I had to just get up and walk myself to the principal's office. And like, my mom didn't know how to talk about it either. And after the school said, well, you were scaring the kids. It's your fault. And I was no longer allowed to speak to the other girls that were witches with me. So that is when I hid my magic. I disconnected from it entirely. I was no longer interested in anything remotely spiritual. And my journey took me to activism, you know, then flash forward in high school, I became the president of the local Amnesty International chapter and I was organizing protests and I just knew I was here to help the world. And unknowingly at that time, my parents did not tell me that Amnesty International was the organization that freed both of my uncles when they were political prisoners being tortured in Turkey. So it was like my soul just knew that I needed to help in this type of way, that I was so blessed to have this freedom and I needed to use it. So I went to school, college in DC, and I was on a path to become an international human rights lawyer. And through that journey, I was working in different NGOs that I started to realize the distortion that was going on in that field, that many of these organizations that were claiming to help were not actually helping, and just all the layers of bureaucracy and I wanted to be with the people. I wanted to talk to them and feel their energy and you know, be on the grounds because I had been doing lots of volunteer work, living with families and connecting with the actual people there. But seeing in DC, it was, it was a political game. So then I asked myself, well, then what do I do my entire life? I've been on this trajectory and now I don't want to do this thing anymore. Then what is my purpose? And that set me on this journey of like asking myself what my purpose was. So I was still thinking of it very much in terms of my career. I thought my purpose is my career. So I'm like, what job do I get, you know, when I graduate? And I started to experience really bad health issues at that time. So I was like deep into Ashtanga yoga, raw vegan, that that whole thing. And at first it was really great for me. But after a few months, I stopped getting my period. One year, two years passed, no period at all. And I was experiencing all sorts of issues. And when I went to the doctors and they got my blood test, they said, your body has gone into perimenopause. Mm -hmm. So when your body goes into perimenopause, when you're 21 years old, you're set up for a lifetime of health challenges. So they said, of course, you're never going to be able to have children, but you're likely going to be handicapped at a young age. You're going to experience just all sorts of issues that happen when your body is not functioning the way that it's supposed to. And they prescribed me over a dozen prescription medications from, I was on hormone replacement therapy. They gave me antidepressants because they said it helps with your gut, like all sorts of things. And 
intuitively, I just knew that there was something deeper going on and that the reason of my health conditions wasn't the lack of these medications. There had to be something that was causing this, but I didn't know what that was. So I just went on this journey of learning about holistic healing for myself, never thinking I would ever do that as, as a career. I was here to save the world, okay? Not, so I just started to study everything I could, and that brought me to Ayurveda, the world's oldest health system and the sister science of yoga. And once I learned about this archetype of the vata, the air energy, it had all my physical symptoms, bloating, gas, constipation, amenorrhea, but also my personality, creative, idealistic, visionary, thinks outside the box, fast moving. And I was like, how does this one archetype literally describe my life? It was like I read my autobiography and I became obsessed with learning everything I could about it. And I had actually been doing volunteer work in India. So when I graduated, I moved to India and I studied Ayurveda where I stayed for two years. And that brought me on this journey of then going into the spiritual side of it, of bringing my mind and body into connection. But what is deeper than that? Because the purpose of health is not to you know, get a gold star and have perfect digestion and like you lived life, but it's so health is not holding me back from my purpose. So again, mm -hmm. what is my purpose? And I started to learn about this concept called dharma, your soul's purpose, the big reason why you are here and how your dosha can actually be related to your dharma. And I was like, wait, my physical conditions can be related to my sacred calling here on earth? And I just went down this, it, it wasn't that at that point, it wasn't so much of a rabbit hole because that's when I started to channel this information where there was nowhere I could be reading about this stuff. I became in relationship with the work and it would start to come through me in different ways. And I was, as I would write, I would just be looking out the window and, and, and text and words were coming through me. And oftentimes it was ancient texts that I had never learned in this lifetime. Gunas, sub gunas, like specific Ayurvedic and Vedic terms that I could not make up that are later verified and, and to be true that went into one of my books, Idiot's Guide to Ayurveda. So I share this entire backstory because for me, my journey has allowed me to see how much my ancestral lineage, how much my health conditions, how much so many of the things that could take someone off track of, I can't live my purpose because that is why I'm living my purpose. And that is why I believe all of us can step into our purposes. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that. And of course, you've shared for us the story, but I'm sure there were all kinds of emotions and difficult moments and, and thoughts along the way. But I want to go back to something you said early in your story, and you spoke about the witch element. You know, one of the things that hit me when I started doing this work 20 something years ago, I had no idea how many of us had fear of persecution or the ancient history of witch persecution, which we now know was actually a really convenient way to get rid of powerful and influential women. You know, I, I grew up thinking, oh, there really were witches and they really were murdered. No, no, no. A lot of <laughs> very powerful, influential women were taken out using that as an excuse. Um, but I have worked with so many people who have similar mm, abilities or leanings as we do, and myself too, where you go through that thing of, can I do this? Can I say this? Can I be out there? So you clearly were very confident about putting that out there as a kid. I'm curious, what form did that take for you? Was it you were telling the kids intuitive things or how did they come to identify you as a witch? And oh, I was making full on do? sigils <laughs> like, yes. I was, like, in it. I had spell books. I was like creating altars for the four directions. And we were like standing in the four directions, calling people in. We would we would talk about the difference because, you know, Massachusetts has so much history. And especially at the beginning, I would be confused about what was real and what wasn't real because I would I would see spirits. And um, so sometimes at the at but the beginning, I would tell people, like, I see the energy of Abraham Lincoln here. And they're like, you are bananas. <laughs> like, you are crazy. Um, but so so then we kind of started to just keep our rituals to ourselves. There were four of us. And that's what really made the kids bully us. And how, how old were you at this point? I was in fourth grade. So 10 years old. 
10 years old. And so you had a concussion because you were pushed down a hill and the teachers told you that was your fault and that you were scaring the kids. There was no compassion or sympathy for you. They basically treated you the exact same way because of their own fear or judgment. Absolutely. Because for them, all they could see was you guys are doing things that's creating disruption. And that's the exact same things that happened during the times of the witch trials, the midwife. Oh, that's disrupting the way that we give birth or the the medicine woman that's disrupting the way that we choose to give our clinical Western medicine. So anyone that's a disruptor, anyone that's a trailblazer, anyone that's just doing things in a different way, of course, the status quo does not want that. Well, I... I was fortunate enough to be on your podcast. Uh, We recorded it a while ago. I know it will probably have come out by the time this show comes out. And I, your, your podcast is called the highest self podcast. And as I was preparing to talk to you today, I was having a little look at, you know, your stuff and 30 million downloads uh, of your podcast, which is a lot of downloads. So in a way, what I love is there's the evidence of you as a disruptor, but in your adulthood, you're a, a positive disruptor, but isn't it interesting that sometimes as children, too much energy or doing something too different, it tends to get quashed down and stamped. Absolutely. I think the fact that the country that I come from, that if my parents had not fled, I legally cannot have a voice. I legally cannot dance. I legally cannot sing. And the fact that I was born into this planet with like creativity exuding out of my pores, but coming from a place where that would literally get you sentenced shows that life continues to foster and blossom even when there is a complete desert. And and to me, that's what the Sahara Rose is about, being that rose even in the desert. Mm, Beautiful. How, How did your parents adjust? So, you know, what age did they come here and what did you witness about their ability to shake off some of the heavy programming that they would have been living under when they came to a different country? My parents have never gone to any type of therapy or healing or any of that because in a lot of immigrant cultures, there's this belief that, well, we're the lucky ones mm. because in a way they are. We're, we're the ones who got out. We're the ones who you know, have success here in the United States. So let's not talk about what happened before. Let's not think about it. Let's just move on. And to them, that's what healing is. And in a way, they definitely have have helped heal our ancestral lineage because they brought us to another part of the world. However, the undercurrents were always there. My father had really bad anger issues that one little thing would cause him to erupt. And for my mom, it manifested into just constant anxiety and worry and fear. And, you know, for every single person, fear manifests in its own way. And it really actually erupted when I was flash forward 23, 24 years old, living in India on this alternative life plan. And they did not understand it. And in fact, they were so scared, you know, so scared that I would end up homeless, so scared because to them, being a creative is being a starving artist. You're, ne- you're never going to make money doing that. And it was at that time that we were constantly fighting, like texting and just they felt like I had basically let down the entire family, that they had sacrificed so much for them to, for, for me to be here in the United States, that this is how I repay them by leaving to India and not getting a stable job and look at just the damage that you are causing on this family. Because again, in a lot of immigrant families, it's very, it's very tribal. And it's like, if one person leaves the tribe, you're hurting all of us. So how dare you? Hmm. And these years I had a lot of confusion of, can I even step into my own purpose or do I owe my parents my life? Because they did create my life, but also it's my life. You know, and I would ask people, then I I ventured to Bali and I would ask everyone I met, I'm like, do your parents know you're here? Like, are they okay with this? Like, you know, (laughs) what's going on? And some of them were like, yeah, my parents visit me in Bali. I'm like, what? And other people are like, I haven't talked to them in 20 years. I'm like, what? And just seeing all of these different realities. Mm -hmm. And finally, the fighting got so bad that I needed to come back to Boston where they lived and just kind of like face off and and have this conversation. And I remember a specific conversation that my dad was just so angry, just yelling at me saying, you're a loser, you're a failure, you're the scum of the earth. I want nothing to do with you. You are no longer my daughter. Hmm. 
And I remember going to my childhood room and just crying on the floor and just looking at my toys and being like, what did they do this all for? Like, follow your dreams, like be your best self. But here I am doing it and I'm dead to them. And then a wave hit me and it was this wave of freedom, this wave of, well, if I don't have anyone else to live for, then I'm going to live for myself. And it no longer became about how do I convince them to understand me while I'm understanding me? It's like, it doesn't matter. I don't need to explain everything I'm doing and get their stamp of approval so I know it's enough. And instead of utilizing all of this energy to get them to understand me, I'm going to focus that energy on my dharma and my path. And maybe one day they'll see it come to fruition and maybe they won't. But I can't continue to live like this. So I got... I had a friend in Bali and she's like, you can co-host a retreat with me in India. I'll pay for your flight. I'm like, I am there. <laughs> and I went back to India and this time didn't feel apologetic about it. Beautiful. And and how were your parents with your work and, and what has since progressed? You know, however much of that they've engaged with or seen. It is extremely triggering for them. And I'm constantly, even yesterday, told you're putting all of us at risk by saying what you're saying. And why can't you just focus on something else? Don't post pictures of yourself online. Like still to this day, I get that every single day. Mm. And it's definitely at this point, I've learned that they can't control me and they, I can't listen. And again, their fear is also coming from this place that in your on, the government will kill you for the things that I'm saying. And, you know, my family does go back to Iran and there is an element of risk for speaking your truth in, in any sort of way. However, for me, it matters so much to be the voice for the voiceless. At least one, li if I can help one person awaken and bring freedom and human rights to this part of the world, then to me, that is, that is worth it. But again, it's, it's their conditioning and that fear of don't let anyone see you because if no one sees you, then you'll be safe. So again, they had to choose the daughter that's like putting, putting herself out there. But I would say that what helped the most in our relationship was when I was really in my power, because sometimes people will kind of want to control you as long as they feel like they can. Mm -hmm. And then once they can't, it's like they have to see you as a sovereign being. And me being in my power for the first time, like this year, I heard my dad say, I love you and I'm proud of you. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And and everything you've said makes sense. I, I think one of the trickiest things for all of us is knowing that there are so many different perspectives that we all have. And our stories and our traumas and our fear and our love informs that. So being able to somehow find the middle ground, especially it's interesting, isn't it? You know, I think of you and I think, you know, you've made a very big impact on a lot of people. So it's, it's not like uh, you're in this small box that, you know, no one can really talk about, especially with the advent of the internet, anyone can go and see what you do. So I can, I can understand it from their perspective. And I love what you said about, you know, they wouldn't do any therapy or any healing because I was just having a conversation about this with a friend. Our parents' generation, it's so interesting, at least in, I can speak about Britain. In Britain, it's considered for their generation that you're a failure if you go to therapy. Mm -hmm. It's not, I'm going to therapy to see if I can improve my life. It's what's wrong with you. So it's a completely different mindset around it. And I feel very fortunate to be alive at a time where, especially thanks to the internet, we have a lot of tools and resources available to us. And I do not remember people talking so much about trauma and repression and oppression in such an emotionally aware way as we've seen just in this last five, six years. It's so beautiful to witness. And I remember growing up, like you would hear like, oh, so-and-so's in therapy. And it was like, they're in, you know, or in rehab, like something like that. Mm -hmm. People had so much judgment over because it meant something must be really wrong with you. And I think today we celebrate it. It's like everyone has multiple therapists, healers, shamans, Reiki practitioners, coaches. And we, you know, we, we want to shout them out from the top of our lungs because we know how helpful it is. One thing my parents did agree to do is they did one family constellation session. And just that was so helpful because it allowed them to look at their relationship with their parents mm. and how maybe some patterns could potentially be going on here. 
How about the rest of your family? How are they in relation to your work? Or do they all tend to take their lead from your parents? Yeah, my brother works for my dad and is very much in that cocoon. Um, my grand, I, So one of my grandmothers, who's my father's mother, was in a forced child marriage when she was 11 years old. Wow. And her entire life, since I remember, she would over and over again tell us the story of what happened to her that night and that she was crying to her dad and begging not to give her away to the stranger man who was my grandfather. He was 27 years old. And basically her father and this man um, had done a business deal. And as like a prize at the end of the business deal, he said, choose one of my daughters. And he said, I'll take the tall one. And her dad was like, oh, she's a little bit too young because typically you're like 14. He's like, I don't mind. It's all, it's okay. I like her. And, and that was that. And she was crying, begging, like, please don't make me go with this stranger man. And her dad was just kicking her saying, you have to go. So that trauma stayed with her her entire life. She never was able to go to school after that. She shortly became pregnant, had four kids. And then when she was actually 27 years old, her husband died. And then she had to live the rest of her life as a widow who in Iran has no rights. You know, it's like it's like you don't exist. So when I was in school, one, one of the areas of study I was doing as international relations was about women's rights and um, the way that they impact the world. So I brought her to speak on stage at Boston University, and she told her story in front of all of the students there, which until she passed away in, in 2020, she would always, every time, she, she would tell the story about what happened to her when she was living, but then she would tell the story about how she went on stage and shared her voice. Amazing. Amazing. You said she got pregnant quite quickly. How old was she when she was first pregnant? 14. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Um. How are you doing with everything that we are seeing go on in Iran right now? Because you are deeply connected to it. Obviously, so many of us are watching with heartbreak, concern, hope uh, that some kind of movement and change can happen. How is it for you? You know, it is a time of complete duality, right? Because we have a lot of hope that mm. This can be the tipping point, that there is enough momentum, that there are enough people internationally speaking about this who even know about this. I mean, growing up, no one even knew what Iran was or where it was on the map or who had ever heard of it. I would just say Persian. People had, or they just thought Aladdin, and that's about, <laughs> and that's about it. So even just the fact that we're talking about it on the podcast for me is still like mind boggling. So there's a time of a lot of hope that we can take this moment in history and be able to create a government that at least just recognizes basic human rights. And it's a time of deep sadness and fear and grief because the average age of the casualties right now is 15 years old. Mm. This is a war on children, specifically a war on high school girls. That is who they're targeting right now, children as young as eight years old. So it's so sad because every single day, you you hear another say say their name say her name and another teenager who has been killed or today it was a 10 year old who has been killed and it's like how many casualties do we need to create a change and the sad part is it's like more more recently when we're recording this now um in november but so the iranian government basically has no laws. They make up laws. They make up their parliament. It's like complete thug government. Hmm. So they said in their parliament that, you know, already any form of political dissent is sentenced as execution. That's always been the case in Iran. And um, their parliament said that like 227 of them out of 270 of them vote to execute all of the political prisoners who just from the past few months is 15,000 people. So... 15, that's like a genocide. But then the the news is saying, oh no, that's fake news because we didn't see them like write the form of the sentence. And they're like thinking of it in this Western mindset. It's like, do you think a government that like kills its children is going to give you like, hey, here's your court date and here's the due process you're going to go through and be sure to pick your last meal. Like mm -hmm. they don't do any of these things. So it's really disheartening because the one time that we got some news, now it's being called fake news. Hmm. And it's like the only time that people will talk about something is if it's fake news instead of actually listening to the lived experiences of the people in Iran. Mm -hmm. And it's it's funny because that fake news term is something that we've become familiar with over like the last six years. And generally, 
fake news is fake. You know, it's like if you, you know, if you really want to just look at it in that way. But what hits me as I'm listening to you, you know, one of the things that has come through for me with the channels that I've done for this book series we're doing, they've spoken a lot about how many of the younger generation we will lose. Uh, they've said that the younger generation are coming in at such a high level of consciousness and such a level of speed that we're not used to. And they are they are here to seed new consciousness. Now, I only thought about it when I heard that in terms of, say, the Western world. And they were talking about the suicide rates that we're seeing. And they were saying, you know, a lot of these sensitive kids are not going to make it with the current reality the way it is because it's too jarring for them. It's It's too old. And then I hear you you know, share some of those statistics. And I'm like, wow, it's the same. It's the same story over there. They are coming in with this brightness and this higher consciousness and saying we can't exist in this. And instead of being able to push through right now, they're being murdered, Mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, the heartbreaking part of it. And yet, as you said, the very fact that this is happening you know, let's hope it doesn't have to happen too many times or over too long a time period for something to shift. But I do feel like we are very new as a global society to, in a way, look at what's going on in other countries in a way that we've never really been able to before. We've never had such access, such information. And so it's a very um, sobering time, I think, for everybody as we as we look at if you like the law of balance and freedom uh, across the world, sure, you can look at your own country and you can see issues around freedom in the system of your own country. But then we have these other countries that to those of us who didn't grow up in those kinds of regimes are just unbelievable to us. Mm. Yeah, that's so interesting that the Z's tuned into that because, you know, the older generation right now is saying that this younger generation is doing what we should have done long ago, Mm. you know, because it's been 43 years of this oppression now and the older generation, like we spoke about, a lot of fears, a lot of, well, I'm not going to risk anything and have kind of been sitting and allowing this to continue to happen. And this younger generation, even though they've never experienced a reality outside of oppression, no that just that possibility of hope is even worth risking their lives for. Yeah. And of course, you know, just on a on a macro level, what they don't realize is by annihilating that many of their youth, they are completely uh, risking the future of the country, the system, because they are annihilating their young. I mean, it's, 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 it, yeah, it, it, I, I can't yeah. even give it words. But- and they're activating so many more. Because yeah. when you when you fight against light, the light gets stronger. Exactly, exactly. So, thank you for sharing your you know y- your relationship to that right now. And you know, I'm going to move off this topic and maybe go a little bit to one of your speciality areas. Um, it's interesting that your purpose had activism and international law as such a such a big a big theme there obviously that was your path of purpose but i know that your book discover your dharma is all about activating our purpose so as someone who is knowledgeable about the energetic and um if you like physical maps that are available to us to understand that could you share something for someone who's like i still don't quite know what my purpose is yes any tidbits So the word dharma really is, to me, the way that I translate it is your soul's unique frequency. So it's not just what you do, but it's who you are. It's not the things that you do. It's how you do those things, why you do those things. It's your texture. It's your scent. It's your radiance. It's the flavor you add to every single thing, you know? like a channel. We are all channels. We are all conduits of the divine. And the expression that it gets is going to come through our unique samskaras, the stories that we have grown up with, and the unique balance of our chakras and the ways that they express through every single one of our being. So in in Vedic texts, they say that we're all born on a pathway towards our dharma. So you were born already living in alignment with your dharma. And I imagine this like a highway that you're going down and you're on cruise control and you're, you know exactly where you're going, but then life has some exits. And the first exit might be, hey, kids, we'll make fun of you if you show up like that. 
or your parents will love you more if you do that, or you'll make more money if you do that, or well, everyone from your town does this. So if you don't do this, you're never going to make it, or you better show up this way, or, you know, it's like, and the exits, it's like Disney World. It's like they keep getting more and more and more, and you're afraid if you don't get off the exit, you might miss it. So most people, they go off one of these exits. And what happens is the universe responds in what we call karma. So karma also has many different definitions, but one of them is bounded action by the universe to keep you in alignment with your dharma. So the karma shows up as the, the resistance. So first it's that tap, tap, tap. Something feels a little bit off. You're feeling a little anxious. This doesn't really feel right, but most of us were used to living that way. And we keep steering off track in the exit away from our dharma. And then the taps get turned into punch, 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 panic attacks, you know, depression, and it keeps getting more and more severe. Some people turn course and other people keep going down that exit. And then the universe is like, okay, they are not responding. We need to make this more transparent here. And that's when it can be an on your knees moment, a, a breakdown, a collision. It looks different for so many different people. And that's not to get you, you know, it's not that karma is necessarily this like this evil force to to like what goes around comes around. That's not the full understanding of it, but it's to protect you because life is not meant to feel like a series of unfortunate events. It's actually meant to be lived in flow. So when we move out of this exit, we finally hit rock bottom. We're not going to continue that way, and we go back towards what feels more resonant for us. We might not know. We never fully know where the end of the highway goes. That's the beauty. We just follow what feels a little bit more expansive for me at this time. Then you start to experience what we call Kriya, effortless action, bringing you towards your Dharma. So that's when you start to experience synchronicities, hearing the right thing at the right time. Maybe it's this podcast. Someone having a conversation, giving the exact codes, which takes you to that next step. The music communicating to you. Oh my God, sometimes I'm writing the lyrics are like, this is what to write next. I'm like, thank you. And it suddenly feels like you're just meeting people and that's guiding you to something else. And before you know it, you're taking 10 steps forward when you're physically taking two. And that is the way that life is meant to be lived. And I remember when I met Deepak Chopra, which was literally walking up to him at a conference, like <laughs> zero connection to him, just walked up to him. And, you know, at that point, I was not sure if I would ever make it as an author. I had just written the book. I barely had any money. And long story short, he ended up writing the forward of the book. And we can go into that story if you want. And all of a sudden, my life went from like living at my grandma's house, not having money, like studying for this real estate exam while crying because I didn't even believe in having houses <laughs> to <laughs> Deepak Chopra running the forward of my Ayurveda book. Like what? And I remember asking him because he was talking about Kriya and flow and, and synchronicities. And I'm like, um, hi, Dr. Chopra. Um, can life always be lived in flow or do periods of flow have to be followed by periods of inertia and heaviness and darkness because it's just things can't always be good, right? And he said, Sahara, if life is not in flow, then something's wrong. And that to me opened up that perspective of, oh, what if this is my new normal? What if I move through life in Kriya? What if I move through life feeling like I'm being propelled by the universe, not pushed back against the universe? That doesn't mean everything is always easy because there's also the collective karma of this world we're living in. Mm -hmm. But it means that I get to choose the path that feels in alignment and resonance for me. And that to me opened up entirely new potential ways of being that I experience today that like, this is my job talking to you who's like predictions I love. And it's so cool because that's what living your dharma is. You get to live a life that is exciting and juicy and it brings out your best. And every single person has that pathway for them. Beautiful. And you you offered up a story about Deepak and the forward, so I couldn't resist. But what 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 is that story? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, when I would be fighting with my parents, I'm like, one day I'm going to be like Deepak Chopra, okay? And they're <laughs> like, you are crazy and he is crazy too. <laughs> so he was always my idol. And, you know, ever since I was, I was young, actually, I got a hold of his, of his books and I would read them. And especially in my early 20s, like I remember just reading, you are not your personality. I'm like, what? I'm not my personality, then who am I? And of course, his legacy of bringing Ayurveda very much into the Western world as well. So 
you know, my first book, I actually got rejected by 30 publishers. They Mm -hmm. all said the exact same things my parents said. You're too young. You're not a doctor. No one cares about Ayurveda. It's never going to happen. So that would have been a really good time to quit, right? But (laughs) I knew that I needed to bring the wisdom that helped bring my body back into balance. It helped me regain my period, regain life force, especially to a lot of millennial women who experience hormonal and digestive issues. It's huge in our generation. So long story short, I applied to write the Idiot's Guide to Ayurveda, which is part of the Idiot's Guide series, like Idiot's Guide to Gardening, Idiot's Guide to Cars. And you know, I would read every single Idiot's Guide book and I submitted my first chapter and proposal and I was hired. And that year I wrote the book. And right before it was about to be published, I was at a yoga and science conference in New York, and I did not know that um, Deepak Chopra was one of the sponsors there. So they just said a quick word from our sponsor, and he just waves on stage, says hello, and that's it. And I just knew this is my chance to go up to him, and I probably will never see him again in the rest of my life, so I just need to take this opportunity. I had no idea like what I was going to say, and we were in an auditorium of like a 1,000 people. This was at like Long Island University, and everyone was leaving the auditorium to go to lunch, and something just took over me, and I just walked down the stairs, up the stairs onto the stage, and I just stand next to him as he's having a conversation with someone. This is the lunch break. He wasn't like giving a talk. I'm not that sketchy, but um, he's having a conversation with someone just standing next to him, and he turns over and says hello. And I'm like, hi, Dr. Chopra. I'm such a fan of your work, and you've inspired me so much, and I've actually wrote this book, Idiot's Guide to Ayurveda, um, and I would love to send it to you. And he's like, sure, here's my email. And I was like, peak life moment right here. I have Dr. Deepak Chopra's email. And like, even if that was it, even if that was the end of the story, that would have been enough. So I was just so full of joy and bliss and like possibility that like, wow, like New York, what a place. (laughs) And um, I'm walking down the street. I, I sent him an email. I sent him the PDF. And to me, like that was it. I sent him the book and beautiful. And this is where it gets crazy. And I know your community will under, I don't tell this story everywhere, but I'm going to tell this, the real story underneath what happened here. So this was the next day. It was a Saturday and I'm walking on the streets of New York. I'm late for this meeting. Me and this girl, were going to record videos. And I'm like eating like my raw vegan sushi while walking, like just completely frazzled. And I'm crossing the street and I hear someone behind me say, can someone help me cross the street? And a voice in my mind says, Sahara, if you're a good person, you help this person cross the street. So I just turn around. I walk back to the sidewalk and I see this man who appears to be homeless. And I ask him, sir, where would you like to go? He links up on my arm and he says, please take me two blocks down into the subway and like help me find this specific subway, like this whole map we have to do. And I'm like, sure. You know what? I'm already late. Let's let's do this. So we're linking arms and we're talking and I can actually still smell his stench today. It was yeah. a very, very strong odor and his face was very discolored. Someone that most people would not want to look at. Mm. And we just start talking and I'm like, so where are you from? It turns out he was a refugee from Iraq who had fled mm. the war. And I'm like, my family's from Iran. And we start talking about it and having this conversation about his kids and how one of them became a doctor and one became a lawyer. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I put him in the subway. And as the elevator is about to close, I ask him, sir, by the way, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to university to teach. I'm a doctor of physics. And the elevator closed. And I was like, wow, what a humans of New York experience I just had right there. Like great conversation with this man. I would have never guessed he's a professor of physics. Like again, just so joyful, so full of life. And I just checked my phone. You know, you check your emails all the time and there's an email from Deepak Chopra. The moment I let go of that man's hand. Hmm. So I opened the email and it says, what is your number? I want to call you. And I'm like, oh my God, am I in trouble? Is he mad at me? <laughs> like, you know, your mind goes there. So I immediately give him my number and he immediately calls and he says, what are you doing on Tuesday? I'm like, I actually don't live here in New York. I, I live in LA. I was living with my grandmother at the time. And he's like, great, because on Tuesday morning I have a lecture for you. You are the universe in San Diego and I would like for you to be there and I would like to meet with you after. I'm like, 
done. <laughs> so my flight happened to be that Monday. The next day, drove down to San Diego and I was like writing all these yantras, like getting myself into energetic alignment and, you know, was shaking during his talk. And after he pointed at me and he took me to a room where it was his team and they asked me a bunch of questions. And after he said, I loved your book. I loved the way that you modernized Ayurveda. You truly have a gift. And I would love to write the forward of your book and invite you to join our team. And there's, it's still on his Instagram. It was like a, a little video that we did that day that he's like announcing me. And I was like, what is going on? So I realized that that man, that homeless man that I saw was not a human, but actually was an angel mm. to help me see, would you respect someone who's also a doctor of physics the same way that you would another doctor of physics who's reputable and who can get you places and who is a star and you've always looked up to and you know is an opportunity for you would you respect that same wisdom if it lived in someone who kept you off course mm -hmm. who no one wanted to look look at who no one even wanted to be around would you respect that wisdom the same way and i believe the fact that i said yes in that moment is what caused all of this to happen wow that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's, yeah, I'm glad you shared that story. Thank you. And, you know, the spiritual lesson that you just shared is one thing, but one thing that hits me, and this is so true for anybody, creating anything, doing anything, hoping for a very aligned relationship in your life or business partnership, and you haven't yet found it, you know, rejection is the path to getting there. But so many times we will recoil from rejection or we will take it personally or we will think what's wrong with us. And I had a, an, an incident in my own personal life in the last few weeks where because of what I do, I got rejected. And it was such a um, surprise because of who it came from. And, you know, I was reminded that, yeah, that's going to be par for the course. And, and I think... There's, some, there's a story that someone told me a while ago about a guy who decided to bring rejection upon himself many, many times. I think he wrote a book about it, and I'm, I'm forgetting what the name of the guy was, but he said that he knew that if he wanted to fulfill his purpose, he had to get very comfortable with rejection because he was uncomfortable with it. And if we look at rejection as a theme in your life, it's been huge, and even to some degree daily, and yet here you are. And, and look at the impact that you've been able to make for those who you are designed to help. So it's, it's beautiful. It's incredible. I love that you shared 30 publishers rejected you. And then someone who many publishers will listen to and respect because of the work he's done and because he's proven himself, he goes, wow, this is brilliant. <laughs> so, you know, this is just a, a message for anyone listening who's in that place that we've all been in or might be in right now where we're like, oh, this rejection means it's not supposed to be. No, it just means it's not the right timing, not the right people. And you're going through another round in yourself of, am I really willing to stand for this in myself? Mm, the right people get it, you know? And it's like, you can try to explain yourself and someone who either is just not on the same wavelength, which is okay. You know, not everyone is going to, or maybe they're just really stuck again in that status quo, like most of those publishers were. Of course, they had never seen a young millennial write a vegan Ayurveda book before. Like, of course, that didn't make any sense to them. But someone who's very intuitive and can see the unseen, and I actually do believe there is has to be some past life history going on here. And I actually have some different downloads around that. But he, for whatever reason, soul contract, intuition, just, just seeing an ability, a talent was able to recognize. And that to me, I mean, to this day, like I had not even had a book come out yet. And he has since written three forwards of all of my books that I'm just forever in reverence for Dr. Chopra. So good. So good. So Sahara, we've, you know, we've talked about a, a good number of things about your life so far. I'm curious, what are you calling in or intending for in the next 12 months, if anything? 
Mm, so like you, we're both channels who channel music. <laughs> and I have my DJ equipment right next to me. But the greatest healer on my path when I was going through all that fighting with my parents was ecstatic dance. Mm. I would go on that ecstatic dance floor. I had never seen ecstatic dance in my life until I went to Ubud, Bali. And at first I went there, I'm like, are these people on drugs? Like they're like rolling around and making okay. all these sounds. But That's totally your first reaction. And, and, right. and then you go, oh my God, this is Mecca. And then I was like, I need to do this at any opportunity. So I... Every Friday, every Sunday, I would find other places and I would just start ecstatic dancing. And I, I really went there because I was very devout to my yoga practice. And it ended up being like dance, you know, not telling my body what to do, but letting my body tell me. Mm. So there would be so many times on that ecstatic dance floor that I would just go through such anger, just anger with my parents. And who do they think they are? And who do they think telling me what to do? Followed by the next song, I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe they've gone through that in such compassion and even sadness. And to the next song, like we're all dancing in harmony and unity together and that oneness and Ananda bliss consciousness and just moving through so many layers, somatically, consciously, intellectually on the dance floor. So more recently, I've realized the limitation of words and how words can only really get us so far. And even the words that we speak right now, even if I was going blah, 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 and you were doing the same, you would get the conversation and, and, and feel its resonance. So that is why I have been especially, so I went to DJ school three years ago and it was always something I just did for friends, did for fun. And I'm like, no, I need to allow people to dance their dharmas hmm. because that is how they're really gonna channel it. So this year I have performed at my first couple music festivals and this coming year, I'm really wanting to expand more upon that, giving people conscious dance experiences where they can unleash their fullest expressions. Well, that was one of the things I really resonated with when I saw you and your work. I was like, oh, this is fantastic. She's a total multidimensional creative as well as, uh, and, and of course, multidimensional creativity is healing. It is spirituality. And for some people, that will be their only connection to spirituality. But that's enough if, if it's working for you and it's moving through you. So I've always loved how music is an invisible force. It's like an invisible accepted healer. <laughs> and we don't tend to judge it. Sure, there are certain genres you might not like or resonate with, but I've not met anybody who doesn't have at least some resonance with music or beats or whatever it is. And so it, it moves through our body. So I love, love, love hearing that you are going out there more and interesting we have a synchronicity there we will talk because um yes. yeah it would be cool I'm gonna to dj some of your music in there <laughs> yeah totally no that would be that's fantastic and perhaps on a on a personal level is there anything that you want to curate for yourself in your life that isn't a thing or a doing or an offering to others it's a personal thing for you and your path your next evolution Mm. So this month, I am going to take a month, next month, I'm going to take the whole month off of December, which I have not done in years. Wow. I'm going back to Bali by myself. And I'm just going to let whatever is meant to happen, happen. Just be back in, into that portal. Bali, especially, I don't know if you've been there, but it feels like being in the womb. I haven't yet. And it's so funny. You are like the fifth person who's brought Bali up to me in the last two months. And every time I'm like, ping, I'm like, okay, you I'm hearing you. And when you just said it. you're taking the whole month off, I'm like, ooh, imagine. <laughs> imagine. imagine. That. So thank you for planting a seed. So you're going to go for the whole month and just see what happens. I'm going to dance. I'm going to drum. I'm going to play music. I'm going to go to the temples and do rituals and also not do and allow space and allow the next version of me to channel through. You know, the, the beauty about being an author and entrepreneur and podcast host is that there are no two same days. And the more energy you put into it, the more that you see. But that can also become kind of like the shadow of it as well, mm. that there's always more to do. There's always something breaking. There's always a fire to put out. And if it's not, then you're thinking what's next to get ahead of it. And I've recognized that sense of urgency within myself, right? Of like, okay, like make sure everything's good. And, and that's probably coming from my ancestral lineage as well. So I'm really needing to take that sacred pause to go into the kapha dosha, the earth energy, because I know that only in being in that soil, my next version will come through. 
I love everything you just described about being an entrepreneur because it's all true. And the other thing that hits me as I'm listening to you is I think psychically too, especially when you're serving communities in with your work, psychically, I think it's good to step back and take a break. And I've managed to do that for like 10 day to two week periods, a bit more over the last couple of years, but you have planted a seed, Sahara. I'm going to be saying, how is December? Tell me. But I also, I also get that, and this is the beauty of taking a break from anything, whether it's a relationship or your work you rearrange and you rebirth. You not only refuel yourself, but you come back different. And that was something I learned many years ago. Very important to be able to step back in whatever form it is. And and if you're in a life where you don't have that ability, start thinking about how can I create that for myself? Even if it's just a weekend, how can I start to create some of that space or freedom for myself? Because it's it's possible to create it. And there are many different ways we can create it. But I love hearing that. So thank you for sharing. Yes. Well, if you ever need Bali recommendations, and some of the places that have really activated me are Bali, um, India, especially Rajasthan. If you ever mm. want to go there, it's just so sacred and I have beautiful. been there, but a long time ago. And India was one of the most powerful trips of my whole life. Oh, it changes you as yeah. a person. Morocco, I, I spent a month there this June, and that was just so beautiful just because the Sahara Desert used to be an ocean. There are mm. there are fossils of starfish in this desert, and it just shows you change is life. And just to see also the beauty that has been created there, it was astonishing. And and also doing volunteer work in all of these places. Anywhere I go, I'm I'm with the people. I visit schools. I visit orphanages. I ask them what they, what they need. I go to local shops to buy those things. And it connects you in such a deeper way because sometimes we're so stuck in our own problems and they seem so important to us. And sometimes just like putting your problems on a shelf, going out there and being of service in this larger way puts everything back into perspective. And then you realize your problems are such a blessing. Yeah, totally. Beautiful. Sahara, thank you so much. This has been a delightful conversation. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I know that many people may already know you, but hopefully uh, viewers and listeners who haven't yet come to know and meet you will get to experience some of your journey, your wisdom. Where is the best place for people to find you? Because I know there are many different places they can go. Yes. If you go on my website, I am saharrose.com. You'll find everything there. Um, there's a quiz people can take called the Dharma archetype quiz. So it helps you understand which archetypes are, are more present in your Dharma, the artist, the visionary, the entrepreneur, et cetera. And you can find my podcast, Highest Self Podcast, Courses Institute, all of that over there. Beautiful. Well, thank you for you know, every now and then I'll meet somebody who just makes me feel happy that they exist oh. and because of the mission that they're on and what they're doing in the world. And you are absolutely one of those people. You've been you've been a real um, blessing for me this year, meeting you, seeing you, coming to know what you're doing. So thank you. And thank you for being here today. Oh, I so deeply appreciate that. Thank you. So check everything out. I am sahararose.com. You can take the quiz that Sahara is talking about. And thank you everyone for tuning in on Impact the World. As ever, if you like our show, you really support us when you subscribe on YouTube or on Apple Podcasts, whichever place you're watching or listening. Take care until next time. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you can join me for Rebirth 2023. This will be our sixth year of holding a rebirth experience in January. And it's something that I originally created because I recognize that the end of a year and the beginning of a new year is a very potent and fertile time for us to let go of what we have walked through and call in what we would like to call in for the year ahead. So as well as practical and grounded guidance around how we do that and open to that, I also bring in my guides who will be very specifically working with the energy of 2023 and what we are about to walk into to help us center, ground, but also call in what it is that we want to next create. The Rebirth experience is very multidimensional. We have everything from Qigong to dance to channeling to grounded teaching to energy exercises to meditations to music. 
We try and bring you as much as we possibly can in as rounded an experience as we can offer so that you can really immerse yourself in one of the themes for this year, which is renew your soul. It's something we all need to do on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So a huge focus of Rebirth this year is renew your soul. And the other side of it is chart your path, helping you to map out the year that you're walking into with intention, with clarity, and with joy. So we look forward to you joining us for Rebirth 2023, where you can renew your soul and chart your path.